Hello and welcome to the Best of the West Book Club with me and Dr. Robillard, ex-Oxford, ex-Eton. And we're going through some neglected texts that we think outline the fundamental problems facing the West today. This week, picking up on our work on envy recently with Nietzsche, Aristotle and Aquinas, we're looking at revolution and counter-revolution by Plinio Carrera de Oliveira. Dr. Robillard, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Good to see you again. And you. So let's go through them, thinking about some of the most important concepts in this text. But first, as always, we'll begin with our prayer, which you are leading this week, if you'd be so kind. Mm -hmm. Come, Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light and fountain of wisdom, pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect, dissipate the darkness which covers me, that of sin and of ignorance. Grant me a penetrating mind to understand, or attentive memory, method and ease in learning, lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Right, so begin with this interesting observation then which is the, the various forms of the crisis that the West is facing today are actually rooted in one single fundamental crisis. So mm. he lists crises of the state, the family, the economy, and culture. But they all come back to one whose mm. field of action is man himself. Now, why is this? Well, man is the unitive feature of all those things that you just mentioned, whether it be that of state or family or social cohesion or, uh, you know, economy, political ordering. Uh, so that will be the fundamental locus uh, at which this battle, you know, between good and evil, between order and chaos, between virtue and vice is, is occurring. And, uh, you know, he starts off really pointing out that, that man is the unit of feature of all those things. Right. And uh, no other creatures make laws or talk about concepts like justice and right mm -hmm. and wrong and equality. So there's something about human beings that means we are able to have this kind of crisis, whereas other animals just can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. T tigers go and do tiger things. Birds do bird things, but they're not, they're not making the internet. They're make, not, you know, debating or fighting over the theories of justice. Oh, right. Okay. Um, apparently we've got another live stream open with people waiting on it. The app must have done two at once. Let me mm. tell people in the chat just to bring them over here. Cool. That's the problem of not using the uh, actual YouTube app itself to stream but the ecam one's better mm. anyway so what we've got then i wonder if we can actually just open that second one up let's ignore it okay, okay. so this is to do with the metaphysical point about human beings then so we are by nature political animals Whereas something like tigers, as you mentioned, aren't. So what we're looking at is a spiritual crisis, ultimately, underlying what are, on the surface of it, cultural, economic ones. Mm -hmm. Does that seem fair to say? Yes. Yep. Okay. So what is the crisis then? What is this one crisis that underlies everything? Let's have a look at the uh, opening remarks in the preface, because I think it does a really good job of outlining it. Hmm. What was your impression of that bit about pride and how it relates to our comments about envy that we mentioned? Yeah, I think I think it, ca it connects up very well with what we were just saying in our last month, yeah, about envy uh, and pride writ large, uh, aggregated over a, a large enough people uh, results in, the, in these um, failed revolutionary utopian projects try to supplant god's authority and uh causes all sorts of mayhem and havoc and, yeah, it's a bit uh, yeah i think that's at the root of it 
that's it. The bit that struck me was its profound cause is an explosion of pride and sensuality that has mm. inspired not one system, but rather a whole chain of ideological systems. And he outlines three big revolutions that mm -hmm. come from this. We've got the pseudo-reformation, the French Revolution, and communism. Mm -hmm. Now, that shouldn't surprise us here in pride and sensuality mentioned, given what we've just looked at. Right. Yeah, yeah. Each of these iterations um, demonstrate a some type of prideful breaking away from natural law and uh, individually and collectively, and also this politically, and then a push towards more and more titillation or chasing of sensual appetites, uh, liberation uh, from uh, or right order, and where those things are, those appetites are justly ordered and uh, moving more and more towards more, more sensuousness, more, more liberation. So what we're looking at there then is similar to what Plato described with the degeneration of the regimes, because mm -hmm. what is explained in this opening point is that pride leads to hatred of all superiority. So that is saying that at its core, the revolutionary impulse is anti-hierarchical. We've got the affirmation that inequality is an evil in itself at yes. all levels. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And you see that through through each iteration that he mentions, whether it be the, the um, Protestant Reformation to the French Revolution to uh, the Communist Revolution. Each of these are, are it's this, on his view, it's the same revolution. It's the same ethic emerging seamlessly in these different periods. Now, that's related to envy in a way, isn't it? If we're thinking about pride as an attack on hierarchy, mm. if it was justice, it's that somehow inequality isn't fair. But if it's mainly about pride and the way in which your own sense of superiority or pride is injured by the excellence of somebody above you, Mm -hmm. And you just want to spike that. You want to level it all. Then that's to do with envy. Envy is the great leveler in that sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you see this. I mean, it's especially by the time you get to um, the reign of terror uh, aspects of the French Revolution or um, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, you see that it, it turns into this just yet yeah, gratu gratuitous bloodlust and and gratuitous harm being brought you know just raise everything just for the hell of it um as opposed to you know building something like a, like a i don't know building anything that's virtuous mm. well this is the analysis that's often missing from these phenomena isn't it that when things go wrong when things go disordered in human individual lives but also society as well sin is at the root of it and all conflict is ultimately theological mm -hmm. who, who said that again you've you mentioned it before i know cardinal uh, manning right okay cardinal yep. manning yes i think it's a good insight but sadly it's the one that's most often missed because people are trying to analyze what are fundamentally spiritual problems through a mm. secular liberal lens yes yes so pride's the big one then, with hatred of superiority. The second one mentioned was sensuality, mm. which tends to sweep aside all barriers. And this has been a combination that other people have made as well. I don't know whether they got it from Jolivera or not, but Edward Fazer, for example, has described woke as the marrying of envy and lust. Now, that's quite similar to saying it's the marrying of mm. pride and sensuality, and it's a really potent combination. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I never knew Fazer had said that, but that's that's spot on and sounds like yeah, a, a, a reiteration of what uh, Joe Oliveira is saying here. Let's think about why those two things are so potent. 
So we talked last time about how Aquinas develops Aristotle's insight into envy, saying that properly speaking, pride and envy are the demonic sins. And you don't need any kind of fleshly component to your being to commit mm -hmm. them. And the devil seeing Adam and Eve created in bliss with the chance of heaven, etc. This he feels in his envy to be an insult to him. But lust, traditionally, the, char the church fathers say um, the higher up demons don't want to stoop to tempting human beings to lust because it's so bestial. It's so far beneath them. Um, and yet the church fathers also say that more humans end up in hell from lust than any other sin. So you've got this really purely demonic one, pride and also envy, combined with the most bestial one that has the most tenacious grip on people and also, as it were, kind of casts its net the widest mm -hmm. and can draw most people into it. So it seems like if you're going to pick two sins, to marry up together to get maximum impact those would be the ones right yeah i was going to say those those do become quite quite a potent combination when when they're combined yeah when we looked at plato's description of the tyrannical soul as well and the way in which restraint was thrown off and how lust drove it i think that was a pretty similar insight to what john Levera is giving here too when he says that it sweeps aside all barriers, it won't accept restraints and leads to revolt against all authority and law, divine or human, ecclesiastical or civil. This is the liberal aspect of the revolution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds spot on as to where we are today. Uh, I mean, this guy, he, he wrote this in 1959, but I mean, <laughs> he... I think he'd be quite surprised at where we are now, but like that, I think is qu quite an apt description of what the present cultural moment is. I mean, you look at a pride parade is the, it is the celebration of the throwing off of, of all shame and all, all restraint. You know, that that's essentially what it is. Right. These are the two things that happen together and reinforce each other too. Um, so, Pride is about not wanting to be subjected to any kind of law or authority that's not of your own making. So it's this drive for autonomy. And fundamentally, it's about like rejecting natural law, so not accepting you're a creature. It's wanting to be mm -hmm. the, the author of your own life as if you are divine. And then when he says the liberal aspect of the rev revolution, how do we understand the term liberal there? Because it, it's got a, a sense in which it's a good thing. So it's good to have the liberty to pursue what is objectively good for us, for example. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. there's a bad kind of liberty too. Yeah, it sounds like a like libertinism, I suppose, um, in that, that version of it, as opposed to, to rightly ordered li liberty to be virtuous, liberty to be a rational agent. So what we're saying is there's no liberty to pursue evil, no genuine liberty. Mm -hmm. What's the um, Aquinas quote? Right has no, or was it sin has no, no right? Or uh, Yeah, that's that it. it so, um, regarding uh, free speech, for example, error has no rights because error. There, there the, is, yeah. the free speech has got instrumental value in that truth is valuable. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. we, we value it because we value the communication of truth. That's what our minds are for. We're, we're rational for the pursuit of truth. So the widespread propagation of error, for example, that doesn't make any sense because you're just putting what is a secondary thing, like the will, um, above what it's really for, which is mm -hmm. the pursuit of knowledge and virtue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think that's what he means here by the liberal aspect of it. Okay, so the three that he mentions then, we've got pseudo-reformation, French Revolution, and communism. Because he sets these up right at the start of his analysis, let's just go through these briefly then. So pseudo-reformation then, and uh, when people ask me, well, when did this all begin? You talk about liberalism a lot, where do we first see it? 
the Reformation is a big one because it's basically just liberalism in religious form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Now, why is that? It is, once again, it's getting back to this, uh, the individual rebelling against naturally ordered hierarchy. And in this case, it's a rebellion against pap papal authority in the magisterium, essentially. It's saying Protestantism, uh, Protestantism at its root is saying that you by yourself can read the Bible, interpret it accurately, and be the ultimate judge of it. And you don't need any kind of intermediary. You don't need any authority, no tradition. So it's all about you, your mm -hmm. autonomous reading and believing. Now, yes. it, it ends up today with 39,000 plus sects of people all saying, well, the Holy Spirit told me something mm -hmm. different from what it told you. And yep. all I really care about is my own autonomous experience and interpretation. So it's splintering into so many different sects because it's got no binding kind of authoritative principle or hierarchy there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to summarize this. There's more that can be said, but we're going to say basically that this pseudo reformation he describes first is you do you in the sphere of religion. That's what mm. Protestantism is. Yep. Okay. So next one the French Revolution, the triumph of egalitarianism in two fields the religious field in the form of atheism speciously labeled as secularism, I like that, and the political field through the false maxim that all inequality is an injustice, mm. all mm. authority a danger, and freedom the supreme good. Yep. I just want to remind people that bit about freedom being the supreme good. We are free to do good. That Freedom itself isn't the supreme good. It's like saying free speech is a value in itself. It's not. It's for communicating truth. It has instrumental value. But what he's correctly pointing out here is that the idea was implanted that all that matters is that you can do stuff. Whether it's good or evil, the thing we care about is that you can do it. Mm -hmm. What The danger of that ethic at a certain point is that when unbounded freedom begins butting up against the metaphysical contours of the good, it can erroneously see the good as being a barrier that needs to be transcended or liberated from, right? So suddenly the, the, the good looks like something that is, that is unjust because it's a, ba it's a boundary upon in infinite freedom. Well, okay. This is a big misconception to clear up then. So, why isn't it good to be able to do whatever you want? So why is there no genuine freedom, say, to act in a way that is contrary to natural law? Because the good is constitutive of natural law. The good and the true and natural law, they're, they're, all, con they're all constitutive of one another. So fundamentally, it's the same way. I mean, logos is in there as well. So it's like, it's not good for me to believe that two plus two is five or to insist that other people believe that two plus two is five. Um, so the, it's a kind of freedom that's turning in on itself uh, or, or against the good or against truth. Right. And we can express that in terms of Catholic moral doctrine by saying that sin is action that is disordered it's contrary to reason mm -hmm. so when scripture says that the the truth shall set you free that's what it's really about so it's action in accordance with mm -hmm. our nature as rational beings so it's what's good for us and think of it as being like when you go bowling and you put the bumpers up and they're stopping you from going in the gutter so the, the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is basically saying, here's how you get a strike. Here's, here's how you win. And then the, the gutters on either side, like you are going to end up in hell if you go that way. So there's genuine freedom only in pursuing the good. We're not going to say, 
But what about the freedom to have abortion <laughs> and fornicate mm. and become a crack addict and things like that? That's slavery to mm -hmm. vice. It's no genuine freedom at all. Exactly. Yeah, because it's, it's, it's contrary to man's nature. Right. Got it. That's the key thing. Once you understand natural law and what we want is the, the flourishing, the fulfillment of us, when we have intellect to pursue knowledge and pursue virtue, this is what freedom really involves. Okay. Now, the next thing is that secularism is a sneaky label for atheism. I like that point. Mm -hmm. So secular liberalism pretends to be neutral regarding religion, but he's pointing out that actually this is really atheism at its core. Yeah, I think that's I think that's correct, and I think we've went. I mean, clearly, like Rod Dreher's pointing this out that we've America has went from a secular country to its beginning or is now a overtly anti-Christian country. So it's a it's sort of a proactive atheism almost, rather than than a a uh, neutral atheism. It's, it's actively hostile now to, to Christianity to, or to any theistic um, values. True. M perhaps more subtly than calling it atheistic, though, I would say that it's more like idolatrous and you end up with a theocracy anyway. So the way mm -hmm. liberalism mm -hmm. tends towards tyranny and totalitarianism historically is because human beings are built for worship and we can't escape that. So it mm -hmm. comes out in some other form. Yes. The, the, the state having uh, subverted the rightly ordered hierarchy, basically wants to become the new religion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When we, This is a bit past what we're going to cover today, but when he gets into the nature of dictatorships, he points this, points this out and says, well, look, the dictatorship can be a dictatorship. It needn't be localized in one authority figure. It, it can be uh, a secular dictatorship that any number of entities could fill that role. Right. Communism is described as the transposition of these maxims to the socio-economic field. So we're beginning with religious liberalism, then we're going towards atheism, labeled as secularism, and then we've got the idea that all equality is an injustice, all inequality is an injustice, and then communism puts that into socio-economic form. Mm -hmm. Okay, now he didn't know about woke at the time he was writing, although it began relatively soon afterwards, but we can think of it as yet another logical development of these same premises. I think that would be mm -hmm. fair to say. Yes. Yep. Okay, so ultimately then, what have we got at the root of this? He says that hearts began to shy away from true devotion to the cross. He mentions how this involves shying away from the love of sacrifice and also mm -hmm. shying away from the aspiration to sanctity and eternal life. And that chivalry, one of the highest expressions of Christian austerity, became amorous and mm -hmm. sentimental. Now, in what way do these features of the crisis relate to those two big fundamental ones that he outlined right at the start. Pride and sensuality or, or lust, we could describe it as. I'd say definitely the point about chivalry becoming amorous and what was the other? Sentimental. Sentimental sounds, yeah, like it's, it's becoming more sensuous and less austere and that once you start having men that are not embracing or embracing those those types of ethics then writ large you're, you're going to get a softer looser society that's more permissive and things order is going to start falling apart and uh we're going to see these various revolutionary tendencies start coming out with nothing to to bound it so scripture does uh, describes the the love of money as the root of all evil people often get that wrong and say it's just money is the root of all evil but it's not that 
is the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, he mentioned austerity here that I thought was an interesting insight. So we move away from chivalry as one of the highest expressions of Christian austerity. So this is about making life difficult for yourself, mm -hmm. putting very high demands on yourself, mortification as well, fasting, not to mention all the other kinds of physical training and having an ideal, which involves being in the world, but not of it. So a lot of it is about self-denial mm. and that can give you a kind of strength. It means that it's not easy to manipulate you. I mean, for one thing, you're someone who is willing to face death rather than bend the knee to something that emasculates him. So mm -hmm. that is what martyrdom ultimately involves. So I will sometimes annoy people by saying when they claim, oh, he's, you know, we, uh, it's because we got subverted. Like the, the West just got subverted. It's, it's not mm -hmm. our fault. We got subverted. Right. You didn't. You sinned. The, you, got, <laughs> you got subverted because you sinned, ultimately. Yeah. Like a, a strong yeah, yeah. culture doesn't get subverted. The, um, what's the saying? That you have to let the vampire in your house kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, in the myth, isn't it? He can't come in the front door unless he's invited. Mm -hmm. yep. But he's always there. And the Bible says that sin is crouching at the door and his desire shall be unto thee. So is there the whole time. And, you know, there's that view that one of the reasons God allows the devil the amount of, what would the metaphor be? Like when you're walking a dog, you can have it on a tight leash, super tight. Mm -hmm. You can keep it right. locked up in its kennel, or you can have a slightly longer leash. Maybe you sometimes even let it off the leash. Uh, God allows the devil the leash that he's got because he serves a purpose, which basically gives us something to fight against. And if you look at something like uh, St. Anthony's trials in the desert, the holier he gets, the harder the devil comes at him. Mm -hmm. and this helps him to rise so being tempted is part of us being tested and it can make us stronger yeah yeah certainly and in the present modern age or political order that we're in the culture that we're in where tolerance seems to be the high highest virtue persons that conduct themselves with that type of internal standard are looked at as well you're judgmental you're not being tolerant you know this is this is a symbol of being intolerant which which is the which, anything goes in the society other than, <laughs> than than having standards or 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 having um yeah so, some something that could be regarded as intolerant so i think that is what um I forgot what you had said before but that, that uh, you I didn't, you didn't say you the, didn't, the hostility i guess that's towards, it yeah. yeah uh you didn't get subverted you sinned so that weakness uh gives an opening so if it's pride or if it is lust or sensuality that is letting these revolutionary impulses get a foot in the door then they're ultimately an expression of that spiritual weakness. Okay. Now, the next point is that he makes some connections between the different forms of revolt that we get. And I thought this was an interesting set of pairings. Mm. The revolt against the king corresponding to the revolt against the pope, the revolt of the common people against the nobles to the revolt, of the ecclesiastical common people, the faithful, against the aristocracy of the church, mm -hmm. the clergy, the affirmation of popular sovereignty to the government of certain sects by the faithful of varying degrees. So let's start with the revolt against the king corresponding to the revolt against the pope. And I think we can even take this further than he does and talk about the revolt against 
the father as well, the the mm -hmm. patriarch, and how this mm -hmm. is filtered down, perhaps more so now than when he was writing, to the original social cell, the family, which also involves rightly structured hierarchy. Because mm -hmm. it begins at the top, like all great revolutions do, a fish rots from the head down, right? And we've got God with the capital F, Father, the atheistic revolt out of pride against that authority, filters all the way down to just the father in the household. But what does Pope mean? Papa, mm. father. So mm. papacy is patriarchy. Yep. And what's the king? Sire. Yep. Extended yeah. father yep. of the nation. Yep. So if you're going to attack the Pope as the father of the church, makes sense to link that to the attack on the king as the father of the extended family of the nation. Mm -hmm. Yep. And further, even more generally, once again, we see this as being just a, a presumed injustice that is built into any kind of hierarchy that that that's what's animating this is that just unrelenting egalitarianism you know okay so we challenge uh the the authority of the pope okay cool that's done what's next all right well the king that that's that that thing stands vertical as well okay gotta take that out okay the father in the home that stands vertical that that that's next on the on the chopping list so this presumed unrelenting egalitarianism is always being good uh i think sh permeates all, all of these various revolutionary epics that he points out we've got a good comment here from john the killing of the king is the heart of the revolutionary spirit you see that in shakespearean tragedy for sure and when i interviewed dr matthew raphael johnson Russian Orthodox. We talked about this with Ivan the Terrible, for example, and why the elites hated him so much is because he was able to defend the people from them. And if you look at what the agenda of the Freemasons was as well with the French Revolution, they know that if you want to bring about revolutionary change in society, you need to first dissolve things into chaos and that means you go after the king most of all you go after mm. that hierarchical principle first yeah sounds like a sounds like the way we do present day <laughs> insurgency counter insurgency asymmetric warfare yeah so it hasn't really changed right well human nature hasn't changed so i can't imagine it's going to change anytime soon either yeah and we know about this with the feminist attack plan on the family, don't we, too? Because mm -hmm. who are they going after most of all? Going after the fathers. That's it. So the, the, the father is the king of the castle of the home. The Englishman's home is his castle. So we get triple prong attack. You've got mm -hmm. God, father, capital F, and then he grants... The king authority, we're not talking divine right of kings, not that theory, but because God is ultimately the author of human nature and human nature is naturally social, we're a rational animal, therefore a social animal, then political authority is ultimately grounded in natural law, which God is the author of. And then we've got the authority of the father within the home too. So... All these things are based on natural law, and then we ground that ultimately in God. There's a triple prong attack. God, Pope, Papa, Father, and then domestic father as well. Faith, flag, family. Right. That's the one. Just explain how those things correspond to the three that I outlined then. So God, Pope, Father, faith, flag, family. How come the flag works along with king um yeah i guess that that's just your, your the heart of your nation is going to be uh king or some sort of patriarchal uh structure like a republic and right. uh 
yeah, and then that trickles down to the patriarchal structure of the family, and then right. large, but that builds builds back up to the nation. That's it. The nation is ultimate works well. Etymology, <laughs> the etymology of nation, nation, natal. Uh, yeah, could, yeah. Give us, uh, some, yeah, you know, some indication towards that. Yeah, certainly does. Okay, now we talked a little bit about the roots of this and the way in which it manifests at different levels. And Jolivera says the situation now is that drunk with dreams of one world republic, of the suppression of an ecclesiastical or civil authority, of the abolition of any church, and of the abolition of the state itself after a transitional dictatorship of the workers, the revolutionary process now brings us to the 20th century neo-barbarism, its most recent and extreme product. Interesting concept, neo-barbarism. Why not just barbarism? How come it's a new kind of barbarism? I, I hadn't picked up on that. That's, it's funny that, you, that, yeah, that he does say neo-barbarism. Well... We've got some pretty cool technology and we're very comfortable and our lives on the surface of things are quite different from those of barbarians. Maybe mm -hmm. that's what he's driving at. Right. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's a, maybe a, it's, it's, it's not an anarchical wasteland, you know, it's not like we're, we're running around, um, uh, in, in trying to fight the Gauls or something like that, but it's the same absence of any any civilizational hierarchical features. Uh, it's just or it's just or organized maybe in a more technological, technocratic um, way. Yeah, we're not running around like that yet. Although, wasn't long ago, was it? About a hundred years ago, with the Bolsheviks, the Mothers and children were prostituting themselves in the street for bread after mm. they made divorce so easy and abolished alimony laws. So things mm. can get pretty barbaric and they might yet still. But right, right. I think neo-barbarism is a pretty accurate term because most people think that mere technology and comfort equals civilization. Mm -hmm. But mm. he's saying, no, that can coexist with barbarism because fundamentally what we've got is an assault on order and hierarchy. Egalitarianism at its heart is about leveling. Mm -hmm. And if you attack that structural principle of society, even including within the family as well, then no one really cares if you've got an iPhone. Yep. 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 The, um, yeah, if anything, the technology, it helps to propagate the barbarism faster and, and better. Uh, it's not like it's going to function as a civ civilizing force in and of itself. Uh, it can be used for, for very pernicious um, tendencies. Um, right. I was just thinking, I, I like the fact that he, that he used the, the word barbarism, though, because, I mean, otherwise, what he's describing is the um, John, John Lennon's Imagine... <laughs> which is uh you know it's it's it sounds it sounds like such a a pretty pretty song but when you listen to the lyrics you're like this is like hell on earth what this guy is describing <laughs> the most subversive song in the world well, tyler's just put a new comment in that i think is a good development of that insight the utopia everyone wants is gratification without struggle or pain it's a distortion of heaven it's without purgatory and struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's well said. It's very well said. I think that I think that's spot on. Isn't there a really good line? Where was it? The priest mentioned it in church at the weekend. Let me try and find it quickly. It was from the Penny Catechism, and he built the homily around it. And he said basically that look, this gives you the the straight answer to what you need to know about what's wrong with these ideologies. Yeah, here we go. Pony Catechism, question 14. Why did God make us? 
God made us to know, love and serve him and to be happy with him forever in heaven. Now, it doesn't say that you've been made to be happy on earth, interestingly. Mm -hmm. But that's what a lot of these things are based on, isn't it? The idea that somehow we're going to build heaven on earth. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that that's the crux of it. You have, you have all, all of these. That's the, the thread that runs through. through. Well, I guess maybe less so with the Protestant Reformation, but definitely with the um, French Revolution and the, the Bolshevik Revolution. It's very much a secular utopian building project. And then... Today, obviously, some some version of wokeism or transhumanism, uh, or WEF one world government <laughs> that's that's doing the same same dance, right? Even with the Protestant Reformation, to be honest, some of the Catholic writers on that at the time, and also some of the Protestants too, explaining what the root of it was, it was that the demands of the Catholic Church were too much basically so a lot of the impositions regarding fasting etc those went so overall protestantism involved less struggle so mm -hmm. there's still a case for this insight applying even there although clearly we're not trying to recreate heaven on, on earth in the same way that Marx, for example is yeah right. there's an aspect of it mm -hmm. okay good this is a pretty useful insight as well. Although the French Revolution ended, the revolutionary process did not end. Which politician was it? It's totally gone from my mind right now, but someone asked him, what was the impact of the French Revolution? And he said, it's too early to tell. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. was it was recent. And I think it was one of the leaders from the far east just top of my head i have to find it out but yeah that that stuck with me that that line so mm. good response so it's like an earthquake that's still shaking yeah yep yeah i think that's well said liberty uh equality and fraternity the other thing that's interesting about that is that it's nonsense but it rhymes and sounds good and was, it's yep. the sloganeering you got to watch out for the sloganeering you always do yeah i i always remember even when i was young in high school um reading about the french revolution wondering why why those values and you know why those right what like fraternity seems to sort of be the the odd one that that gets thrown in there but like you said yeah it, it rhymes but seems like the designers of that slogan never really consider the degree of the commensurate commensurability between any of these values well this is one of the problems with free speech as well isn't it because we're not always driven by reason by logic sometimes we're driven by jingles which is what advertising exploits mm. too so yep. there are all kinds of ways to package a message that isn't true to make people buy it and yep. you see this very often politically as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. build back better change <laughs> yeah who doesn't, who doesn't want change or um sometimes it's almost like a cruel joke like the people's republic and it just ends up mm. mass murdering the people like they can't mm. resist mm. The making a fool of out of anyone who's willing to yeah. believe it <laughs> yeah 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 so we go back further though given what he's outlined as the three main revolutions and say that the the true seismic earthquake was the reformation mm -hmm. and that's the mm -hmm. one that the french revolution is an aftershock of that's the one that hasn't yet settled and we can still detect with our seismographs in culture today which seems to be a, I mean, w w when's the last like political candidate in contemporary times has like that has actually been a talking point, right? It's it's almost just regarded like that. Well, th this is just in the past. This is this is settled 
secular scripture by now, and we're just going to that that's that's just some something in the past and and it's 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 calcified and now we're gonna move forward with with other issues um you know and like that that's just a, that's that's not like a live political issue right now it's not a lot you know i mean it hasn't been since treaty of westphalia i suppose um if you really think about it like the the, polit- the political or metapolitical discourse doesn't really talk about that you, you have academics talk about it but it's not like a live political issue yeah there's some theologians write about it but it's def it's not in the media as being a talking point that's for sure mm-hmm. i think it's michael right. gillespie i think his name was um i remember looking at a book called the theological origins of modernity and he goes down that road explaining that look this is fundamentally a theological crisis mm-hmm. and tracks mm-hmm. it all the way back to them but no, in terms of this as being a lens through which we can analyze contemporary events, no, that would be Cardinal Manning's insight that it's a spiritual crisis above all. And yep. that is rarely yep. mentioned. Oh, we've got a question from Andrea saying, I don't see the connection between the Reformation and the French Revolution. We talked about it a bit at the start of the stream, saying that mm. basically the Reformation is liberalism in religious form, in that it's an attack on the authority, hierarchy, and tradition of the church. And the French Revolution continues that, obviously, but then applies it more broadly beyond just the church itself. Do you think that's mm. accurate, Mike? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, the institutions of the. Um... Yeah, the French governance were then attacked after the um, institutions of the church, right? In the in the uh, Reformation, yeah. and the the counter revolutionary writers in France were saying things, and then this is people like um, Louis de Bonald, for example, um, saying, "Look, the family is the core. We need to get um, strong patriarchal instruction. We need to get the Decalogue." And this is how we can resist this. So they were saying the same kind of things that I say, that you say, that Tim says, that Elliot says, that we talk about on CMASK. Mm, mm-hmm. It hasn't changed. The problems haven't changed. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, the next slide. Why is that not working? Here we go. This revolution has its ultimate origin in certain disordered tendencies. So we're going to circle back a bit now and just think about um, order and disorder. So we're Mm. talking about uh, natural law as involving human beings being ordered towards the pursuit of knowledge and virtue. virtue. That's our our, our telos. Mm. And he's saying that Disordered tendencies serve as the soul of the revolution and its most intimate driving force. Mm-hmm. And the two things that he highlighted as the ultimate roots were pride and sensuality. And sin is action that is contrary to reason. Virtue is rational action, vice is irrational action, basically, mm-hmm. which is why. Um, Vice destroys, eventually, as Aquinas puts it really bluntly, just says vice destroys. So these are the soul of the revolution then. Um, In what way are they so disordered? They're disordered, I guess, individually with respect to, yeah, to to sensuous appetites uh, being liberated and expressed and then writ large they're disordered in terms of not not behaving or structuring society that is conducive to the common good and to the family and to the flourishing of the of the um the the social order uh i think that those that's probably probably the individual and then collective way in which that that shapes up and the biggest manifestation of this given that all sin is the inordinate desire or inordinate 
pursuit of a, a lesser good, like where God should be. The ultimate problem with this revolutionary insult, uh, impulse is trying to uh, put something else in the mm. place of God. And if you get right. the big things wrong, then the small things don't go right. You, if you don't put mm -hmm. first things first, like C.S. Lewis said, then yep. you lose all of it. Yes. Yeah. Now, I guess this is something to do with ease, comfort, the love of money, like Paul writes about in his letters. And we talked about how with Woke in particular, it's a marrying of envy and lust, which is similar to what Oliveira is saying here. So the way to counteract this then is to bring things back into order. Now, he says here on that insight that one must live as one thinks under pain of sooner or later ending up thinking as one has lived. Mm -hmm. St. Augustine says something very similar to this too. And uh, writers like Pascal talk about a lot of the rituals of the church um, being a way of training the the animal in us. So it's important, mm. given that we are not angels but animals, to go through habits, go through motions, mm -hmm. and have things that involve the body. But yep. as we saw with Plato, with the way in which regimes can degenerate, you get the opposite effect working too. Vice mm, is pretty yes. easy. Human beings can fall into it quickly. It becomes powerfully established. And then it snowballs, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. There's def I mean, we're hylomorphic beings. So there's going to be a looping effect between our physical actions and our thinking and, and vice versa, our, our thinking and our, our physical actions and physical habits. So we need to be vigilant and guard against both of those things, uh, physical tendencies and and tendencies of thought to ensure that they're virtuous and not vicious. And we've got, uh, as Catholics, four of the seven sacraments giving grace, giving light to the intellect, whereas sin ends up darkening the mind. So that's another way in which this insight is a profound one mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because eventually if you are thinking as you live you're not really going to be thinking at all if the way you are living is irrational so really true degeneracy ends up with you not even really understanding why what you're doing is wrong c.s lewis makes this point yeah it's, it's a really horrifying point when you think about it that it's really God's grace is the only thing that can bring people's people back after a certain point because the, the, they're so they're sinning so much and clouding their intellect so much and then sinning so much that they're they're just lost right they're 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 lost and they're they're not even aware that they're lost at that point so um, that's a it's a horrifying and tragic space to to consider yeah my uh, my only fans pays for my abortions yeah and and distracts me from um reflecting or distracts me from reading scripture or listening to my conscience yeah M maybe i saw what was wrong with it one day but now i don't even think about it yeah i, I just party more and numb myself out so i don't have to think about it yeah. right so people thinking that ideas are something they can just separate off from the rest of life and that what goes on in the ivory tower of academia stays there. Jolivera says that no, the transformation of the ideas extends in turn to the terrain of facts. This, this was actually the... This might have been the most impactful sentence that I've read so far in this book was that I mean, he, he wrote this in 59, but I mean, he pretty much nailed exactly where we are right now, where it's that you have folks that they've, they're so caught up in pride and envy 
And when the facts don't align with how they want the world to be, well, then it's true for them. You know, that there are no facts. Uh, everything's just a social construction, the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so postmodernism just gets brought out as this bludgeon uh, to, you know, if facts get in the way of one's you do you attitude, then we need to get rid of facts. That's that's where, where they're at. Right self-refuting ultimately because like Nietzsche found out the hard way if you say nothing is true then well, that means whatever ideas you're putting forward as well and you're you're stuck with a contradiction there yep. and if they yep. want to embrace that then chaos is going to ensue but ideas have got consequences for sure that's one of the big themes of the whole book isn't it that we can mm -hmm. trace this to ideas like hierarchy is always a bad thing what does it look like if you play that out over the centuries something like mm. what we've got today yeah yeah yep but we're not going to get black pilled and doom and gloom about it because mm -hmm. just like we saw with plato whatever society you are born into you still have free will and you still have the choice you can still live virtuously and Jolivera says that man's free will, aided by grace, can overcome any crisis. And if we were looking at the history of the church, for example, and the promise made that the gates of hell won't prevail against it, it's still here and has gone through mm. worse popes than Francis by far. And the Soviet Union fell mm. not long ago, and that was what many people thought would be impossible. Look, the armed might of communism. Mm. Mm. Look at the size of this state. Look at the resources it's got. And it fell. So yep. eventually reality gets the last laugh. Yes. Yep. Aided by grace, though. Aided by grace. Aided by grace and um, requiring the agency and cooperation of of man's will right so it's like we have to till the field and practice the natural virtues and then grace can be planted in that can be infused so we've got work to do for sure mm -hmm. okay good we covered a lot and looked at some angles that aren't normally brought to bear on these topics so whereas mm -hmm. most people are saying that this is all economic um, that's the, the general tendency of modern political analysis following Marx is to say that all these problems are somehow um, economic in nature. It's about mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. poor and the rich. But no, this analysis is deeper and saying this is ultimately undergirded by sin. It's a spiritual phenomenon. And we've got pride and sensuality or envy and lust as the heart of it. Certainly. Yep. And that is... I think a good insight or it, there's an optimistic lens that we can bring to that because that gives us something to work on. That gives us something, you know, it's not the, as, as um, one of your guests on your interview said, it's not, not this machinery in the sky that we're completely at the um, mercy of, you know, we, we can work on attending to these, these things in, in our own lives. And, and that's, that's plenty, plenty of work to do for, for all of us. Definitely. Well, good message for people to take away the the work in some sense is the same work that we always have who was it saint alphonsus i think being men we sin every day but we have to renew and rebuild every day as well so it's a continual battle there's a really frightening image that some of the church fathers use that basically the the devil is most active at night and things start coming apart the seams and there's no save button and it's constant work mm. man's life upon earth is a warfare as the book of job puts it and the battle's definitely more intense than usual perhaps right now but we shouldn't expect anything else mm. yeah all right well john nice comment to finish on we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against powers principalities spiritual wickedness in high places but we've got strong backup, so we are not afraid of it. All right, guys, thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. 
and I'll put a link to the PDF of this book in the chat, in the comments when this video goes uploaded in a second for you to read ahead ready for next week. And it'll be probably chapters four, five, and six. All right, take care. And I'll see you Sounds on good. Friday, Mike, for CMask. Sounds good. Take care, everyone.